Welcome to Playing Above the Line, where we interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and community activists to get their thoughts and perspectives on leadership. Playing Above the Line is sponsored by Aviso Group, a business consulting and accounting firm focused on preparing clients for the future through innovation and positive growth. Welcome to Playing Above the Line. I'm Alan, your host, and I am very excited about today's episode, as I know producer Carrie is, because she has known our guest, George Diaz, for many, many years. She actually interned with him down in Miami in, in one of his businesses and is good friends with her with his oldest daughter. And so we'll probably hear from Carrie on this episode. I'm going to bring her in and let her talk some with George as well, because they have that relationship. But George is the founder and president of Larry Jacob Internet Marketing. And so, George, thanks for joining us. No, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. Well, so let's just start out. Tell me a little bit about your business as it currently is now and and what you guys do. And we'll go from there. Sure. I started this business as a side gig 10 years ago. Coming up on eight years ago, I went full time. I was laid off by my business. Matter of fact, it's the company that Carrie uh, interned with me many years ago. Okay. I decided, okay, I'm going to make this work. We're a company that works with small businesses that are trying to become more effective online. We build everything from websites to internet marketing campaigns, uh, social media, things like that. Our real sweet spot is working with small business owners that have online courses of different types. And that can be anywhere from, we have a guy now who's, who's got a course for Excel users that are like way up there on the advanced sort of level. And so we're building an environment for him to teach that sort of content to people who are paying for it along with the, the sales funnels that go with it. I got you. Well, Carrie, so let me just kind of bring you in right now. You and I were always talking about who will be a good podcast guest. And you mentioned George and the fact that you work with him. So tell me what, number one, what did you learn from him? And what about George made you think that he would be a great person to talk about entrepreneurship? The reason why I thought he would be great to be on the podcast is because I know him and his ambition and how hard he has always worked. He's always been a really good resource. Mm -hmm. I have been able to have good, just personal conversations with him, which you know is important for me when I'm in especially a mentor mentee type relationship. Mm -hmm. He obviously gave me my first real corporate type working experience. And as we were talking about before we recorded, it was more than that. Like we rode to work together. I learned a lot about professionalism from him. If you had to say, who was your first professional mentor? It would be George. Mm. That's great. Well, and so the relationship part there sounds to me like it was very important to both of you. And we'll actually talk about that some more because before we started recording again, George was talking about a new campaign that he started. And so we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but so George, I mean, the, the genesis of you kind of becoming your own boss and founding Larry Jacob internet marketing in your show primer, you, you mentioned when you were interviewing for a CIO role, the, the guy that you were interviewing with told you something about that particular position that kind of drove you to step outside your comfort zone and, and get out of the IT space into, into sales and that kind of thing. So talk about that. What was the genesis of what you're doing now? I was out of work and looking for work. And my background is technology. I, I've got a computer science degree going way back, back when people were using punch cards and archaic sort of technology. I was in a, a director of technology role for you know a large uh, restaurant chain and i was looking at what my boss was doing and that did not seem it just didn't seem really attractive to me it's like get all the grief and get none of the glory and then i i was interviewing for positions and the position i was i was interviewing for one of the interviewees was the guy who currently held the role and i remember asking him i'm going hey so why are you moving on and, and what are you going to be doing next he goes well i've been at this company for a while and i'm jumping over into sales Because no CEO ever comes out of the CIO position. Now, that may have changed in the last 10 or so years. Mm -hmm. I didn't really see myself as a CEO of a a company. That just wasn't something I saw in my future. But I did see myself as someone who wanted to be running my own business. And boy, have I learned that if you cannot sell, you better not be in business for yourself. Well, right. We've heard that multiple times. And so being able to monetize your passion is important. And part of monetizing your passion is to be able to support yourself financially and turn that passion into something that will be financially viable, which is, I think what you've done, but you also talk about the fact that, okay, you went out, you started this new business, but then it was kind of all consuming. Right. And so that I guess search for the work-life balance that it sounds like maybe you didn't find it to begin with, but you slowly 
were able to to get that a little bit more yeah, and, and like you liked it. it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a techie guy, so I like to plan. I like to study things. I like to execute things on a plan. I had lost my job four times in about 10 years from 2000 to about 2010. And so it kind of puts you in a financial bind. We had some debt accumulated. So when I lost my job, no, the fourth one was in 2013. When I lost that job, it's not like I had a nice kitty to rely on. Mm -hmm. So we were really tight financially. And so in order for us to survive, I literally had to put my 100% all into this job. And I can be very intense. I can be very driven. I can be very determined and saying, look, this ain't going to fail no matter what. But, you know, I was really cutting corners on the family life, on my personal life, you know, the emotional drain, my relationship with my wife and even my spiritual walk. So I kind of went, went to empty really fast. Well, one thing that you said, I watched a little video, you sent us a little clip of a video that you did on Facebook talking about this. And one of the things you said that really, I guess, resonated with me is that more time does not necessarily equal more success. Yeah. Right. So talk about that. I mean, what, what do people need to do if they're not, I mean, they're spending time, more time, more time, and they're not having the success that they, that they really want, because you're right. More time doesn't equal more success typically. So then, then what, I mean, what's the next step? Yeah, years ago, I worked for compact computers in Houston. And I remember when I jumped out of technology and into management, I was talking to my boss who was, you know, we had a great relationship. He, he mentored me, you know, my first management job. And, and I go, you know, I feel like I don't do anything all day. And he says, yeah, it's kind of the, that's kind of the drama that happens to a lot of doers who now become managers because you're, you're becoming productive by making the most of the resources and the people you have working for you. You know, what ended up happening is since you're so tight on money at the beginning and your mentality, you have kind of a scarcity mentality, you end up trying to do as much as you can yourself, avoiding expenses that you're kind of perceiving as not necessary. And you're basically prolonging the misery, I like to say. I mean, you have to be smart about your expenditures, but I spend very little time now doing the website developing, the programming, the social media management, and I'm relying upon a team. And we're not even that big a team. I have four, four and a half people working for me. And my job is basically to throw work at them and train them so that they can take on responsibilities that, you know, I want to say four or five years ago was all on me. Right. And another quote that you had is you finally realized that you own the business, the business is not on you. And so it sounds like that it was a, it was a journey to get there, but you finally got there and it sounds like you're reaping the rewards of that. Um, So that's great. Yeah. And sometimes the decision is kind of thrown on you. I mean, when you're basically spent, burnt out and I'm kind of going, do I really want to do this like this? It was really, a, I, I've got to change things because this just can't continue like this. And it was really a wake up call to, okay, how do I do things differently so that not only am I supporting my family, my business is succeeding, but I also have a life and more importantly, the relationships I want to have flourish. Right. Well, and I think that's a great insight for all entrepreneurs out there, because I think more times than not, people like yourself fall into that trap where it is so easy to absolutely be 100% all in on your business, which you should be, but it's also easy to just spend all your time there. You can never flip that switch from on to off. Right. And so you got to find a way to be able to, to be able to do that. And you know, what I find is oftentimes when I'm not at work, I get these epiphanies, these ahas. It's like, Oh, hold on. I didn't think of that. Creativity kind of dawns on you when you're not focused. And when you are very stressed, when worry and anxiety is kind of a big part of your day to day, you really aren't at your best. I mean, on top of the fact that we're in a very creative field, mm-hmm. both on the technical side and on the visual design and you know the marketing side, you can't afford to not be at your creative best. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Well, as Carrie mentioned earlier, you're one of her mentors. You mentioned a couple of guys in your show primer that had an impact on you. So talk about Bob Britton and Micah Mitchell and the impact they had on you and maybe what they taught you. So yes, this is way before I was doing this full time. So I basically took some vacation days to go to a conference out in Arizona. We do a lot of work with a company called Keep. They're formerly known as Infusionsoft. They're a marketing automation product company. 
And I went out there for their convention of sorts. And I expected to go there and meet a lot of fellow techies because I came out of, you know, I was a Microsoft partner. I had been Java certified. I, I attended a lot of these and I expected to run into a bunch of gearheads <laughs> that I could kind of rub elbows with, learn the ropes from. And ends up, it was a bunch of very untechnical users. And it was a real eye opener to me how the market worked with them. And I'm going, gosh, I could supply these people with a lot of services. And I went to you know, like these conventions typically have, it's like, hey, meet us for a six o'clock show presentation of some sort. And I was thinking, man, this might just be a great way to get some free drinks. <laughs> and I go there and there was no drinks. It was basically three guys explaining from stage, hey, can you afford to learn on your own what we have learned over the past five, six years working with Infusionsoft and their customers. And in the back of my mind, it's like, I've got a day job, I've got a family to raise, and you can only learn things that fast on your own. And so I dove into this group. It cost me $779 a month that I did not have. And it was to participate in a mastermind with these guys. Now, Bob Britton had been the previous year's Infusionsoft customer of the year. This guy basically in 2010 was automating an auto repair shop, if you can believe that. Mm. People would park in their cars and they would leave already having their credit card charged and their invoice basically on the dashboard. Oh, wow. I mean, he was way ahead of the time. Yeah. And then Micah was a product guy who sold the product for building membership sites or online course sites. Mm -hmm. And I was doing only website development at the time because, George, you know how to do website development. Learn how to do these membership sites. And I'm kind of going, why do I want to do that? And I, I just did not see it. Between both of those guys, uh, Bob basically just slapped me into shape. going, <laughs> George, quit doing video editing for people. Quit you know, trying to be everything to everybody. Find a niche where you're really good and then... Every time I'd come up with another brilliant idea, he'd say, George, stick with one thing, which was terrifying at the time. And then Micah basically said, hey, here's a technology. Um, I mean, he, he basically gave me a huge technology tutorial, which was kind of part of the program I was in. But very few people in our mastermind group were technical enough to really be able to do that. I got you. Well, and one of the things you said I thought was interesting was part of what they taught you is that. Success in business has very little to do with the skills required to deliver your product or your service, but it's got everything to do with the ability to sell, to master the operational side. And I think even inheriting what you were talking about was the relationship part two, which we'll get to, right? And so I think a lot of people think falsely that if they are excellent technically, that they will automatically be able to have a successful business. Well, I mean, I think what you're saying is that's not necessarily true because you've got to have the other parts as well. Well, th that is absolutely not true in my opinion. <laughs> absolutely not true. I mean, how many businesses are run by people who have no clue about the subject matter, mm -hmm. but they know how to package it in such a way? I mean, I, I could come up and start an accounting firm with three junior accountants and go to business that way. I mean, I could. It might not be the smartest way to go about it. But uh, one of the things, and Bob was really a big proponent of this, is kind of like sell something that doesn't even exist yet. And I go, well, how can I do that? I go, if you sell something that doesn't exist and it's a flop, you didn't invest that much time in it. You didn't build this huge monolithic infrastructure for delivering services and then realize that the market doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of encouragement of try stuff. And he said, Suppose you sell a $500 or a $2,000 something, and then you realize I can't deliver this. Give the $2,000 back. Yeah. That mentality for me as a technical person was just completely mm -hmm. foreign. Yeah. But it really got me out of my head going, hey, you don't have to have every single duck in a row in order to sell something. And that, that kind of putting the, you know, I want to say the cart before the horse thinking really changed the way I ran my business. Yeah. So let's talk about the, uh, we've danced around a little bit, the relationship part. So you, you started a campaign called Celebrate the Relationships. And so talk about what that is, why it's important, why you decided that you needed to, you know, actually have a campaign called Celebrate the Relationships. Right, right. So if you go to celebratingrelationships.com, it's basically a Facebook page right now. It, it's going to grow into more than that. 
what I think everybody needs to be doing is work on your own personal brand. And the reason why that's important is because today, people are more interested in who you are and what you stand for than what you're selling. Mm -hmm. If you follow me closely, you know that red and white wine drinking, good eating, grilling on my Weber, that's what I am really all about. I can have so much fun talking about it, working on campaigns about them. So people get to know who I am. And if, by the way, someone comes up and says, George, what do you do? I'm more than happy. Oh, you know, we help small businesses with their marketing. But I know so many people who have their priorities screwed up, don't have what I'm very blessed to have with wife of 37 years, three kids, a granddaughter on the way. That's what life is really about. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, by the way, I got to run a business because I got a female. <laughs> Well, that's great. I, I love that philosophy. And Carrie, I mean, you know, I mean, you've been a part of every episode that we've done of playing above the line, but I don't know how many times the word relationship has come up, but it's been a lot. It sounds like George subscribes to, to our theory. Did you get that sense when you worked for George back, you know, how many years ago it's been now that when you were interning with him, it's come across very clearly to me on this Zoom podcast, but I'm just curious to know working with him, what, what you thought about that. The answer to your question is yes, that's who he is. It is relationship first. We talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners who they focus on the successful parts of their journey. They say it was really hard, but they don't go through the journey the way that George has here. And so I really appreciated the honesty. And I think that when you do put the focus on that, you can find the pieces that are more important. Like I know that we have people all the time who talk about how important relationships are, but they are talking about employer employee relationships. Right. George is talking about or, or client client business relationships. Right. And George is talking about human relationships. Yeah. He's not talking about it from the necessarily standpoint of success. He's talking about it as an actual value. So I mean yes, that's who he is. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, people want to hang out with people who are real and that realness hopefully means like them in some way, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was, I don't know, I was like really big into rock climbing and I'm one of these guys that's a daredevil. Well, I probably will attract that daredevil audience, but that's not who I am. I don't want to come anywhere near rock. Uh, (laughs) But but it was Bob Britton that came up and said, George, you come across as very, you know, he, he wouldn't have used the word humble, but someone who comes across as not haughty, not full of himself. And he goes, George, you're a great engineer, but that's a winner quality. And he goes, put it into your marketing. And this was, you know, my fledgling little business years ago. And he says, if someone was getting ready to make a decision for online marketing between George, who's got, you know, again, 37 years being married, he's got three kids who seem pretty stable, normal. You're you're picking George or you're picking some kid who's a fast talking MBA grad is single, lives by himself. That gives you different levels of confidence in the person's abilities. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And and so I'm saying a a lot of people want to hide this. When I was in the corporate world, you kind of kept your personal life kind of behind the facade. Mm -hmm. And I mean, first of all, I work for myself. I mean, I, I can't be fired. My wife sometimes says I can (laughs) But I'm fine telling you that the way I got to that Bob Britton, Micah Mitchell conference was by, you know, I was able, I go, if I can get $400 cash, my wife worked for the airline so I can get a free ticket. And I stayed at a dive hotel. That's how I got there. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, most people's like, hide that, pretend that's not true. But it's like, there are business owners out there who are probably dying because they're thinking, I can't afford to do this. And it's kind of like, eh, maybe you can't, but I did, but it's kind of the path I had to follow. And I'm not ashamed to share that with people. Well, and people are attracted to genuine people, right? And that's what you're, that's what you're talking about. I mean, you're a genuine person and what you see is what you get and and people respond to that more often than not, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm a, 18, 19, 20, 30 year old, whatever, who is wanting to do something on my own. I'm wanting to start my own business. I'm wanting to break away from my corporate life. What advice do you have for me? What, 
is either the, the single best piece of advice that you got or what is a piece of advice that you can give from your personal experience that would that would kind of help someone who is looking to do what you did? Yeah. You know, I'm going to answer that question with two answers. On one side, the responsible engineer raised by immigrant George. <laughs> it's like, man, sock away as much money as you can. Make sure you got something to fall back on. And don't throw more stress on yourself than you need to, especially, you know, unnecessarily. And, and that, I mean, if you're, for example, if you're single and you can move in with your parents, you know, that doesn't work for everybody. But I mean, if you can make your expenses as low as possible, it makes it so much easier because the pressure is off of you. You're not sitting there going, if I close this deal, I can pay the power bill, right? So I'm saying that on one side, right? On the other side, I'm saying the majority of people that I have worked with, and, and I, I used to also coach people who were out of work. Because I had the experience of losing my job so many times, I became a coach for people that were job hunting. Mm -hmm. More times than not, people are more conservative and uh, in the grips of fear than they should be someone comes up and has a great idea, you bounce it off of someone else and, and you got 10 people going, man, that's a great business idea. You ought to go with it. And then you talk to them a year later. It's like, hey, did you ever move forward? He goes, nah, man. You know, and then you know what it is. They, they have that fear. And I tell you what, I got laid off from Terramark, which was the company that, you know, Verizon eventually bought and, and whatever. And that's mm -hmm. the company that Carrie interned with me. If they had not let me go, I don't know how long it would have taken for me to quit. Because it's like, dude, I got the paycheck coming in every month versus the other side. And that fear of annihilation, I think that we all have, can dominate you and keep you from doing something that might be a lot better for you. Yeah, no doubt. I think that's great advice. And, and you know, we've said it before on the podcast with different guests, but you know, you can only plan so long for something like that until it becomes procrastination inherent in being successful and what you're doing is you've got to start, you've got to take action. And so I think that's what you just said much more eloquently than I, than I just did, I'm sure. But I, but I do appreciate that insight. Yeah, it, it was a side gig for me for three and a half years. Yeah. I mean, where I was, I had incorporated the business in 2010 and it wasn't until the very end of 13 or 14 that I finally, you know, went hundred percent. I took off the training <laughs> wheels and went. Well, obviously it's worked out very well. I know that you certainly have to be proud of what you built. And I think that's, uh, I think that's awesome. I do want to ask you one more thing before we kind of start wrapping up, but you mentioned your team four, four and a half, five people. But what I find interesting is they're all over the world. I mean, you said you've got somebody in Kuwait, Philippines, Bangladesh, Spain, how in the world, and I don't think you've ever met any of them in person, right? So they're important members of your team. You've never met them. You obviously can do business over zoom and that kind of thing, which is, which is great. But um, talk about just managing that I mean, in different time zones, different parts of the world, what does that look like? Sure. Bob Britton gets credit for this one. I was employing college students because I was teaching at the university. So I had access to, mm -hmm. you know, these kids, many of them were really sharp. And when you're teaching them, you can cherry pick the ones that are kind of the sharpest, but they're looking for a career long-term or uh, they go, oh, hey, we got final exams coming up. And so the reliability was, was not there. And so Bob says, hey, talk to this other guy because he hires people from uh, overseas. And, you know, it was some guy out of San Diego. And that was the way I connected up with my first overseas lady, Danica, who has since left my business and is kind of a competitor. She's really done well for herself. What I found is being virtual is pretty easy to do if you know how to do it. And before Zoom, there, you know, they've been other technologies most of the time, we weren't even using cameras. We were just talking to each other or chatting. And they're really good ways to recruit folks, depending on the skill sets that you're looking for. One of my, um, Spencer is one of, he's basically one of my top leads. He's out of the Canary Islands. He ends up, most people, if they don't ask, they don't know that he's in the Canary Islands, but he speaks English and he looks about as American as anybody here. Yeah. He works, Spain is five hours ahead of us. So he starts his day earlier than us. He's probably off about two o'clock. Mm -hmm. The two people I got, Anson and Rochelle, who work out of, they're right near Manila in the Philippines. So they're exactly 12 hours off on the clock from Eastern time. Okay. And so 
they work like an evening shift. Anson works a little bit earlier and then he overlaps me by three or four hours. Rochelle prefers to work late. So I think she just kind of has fun and does her thing during the day. And she starts her shift like, you know, six, seven in the morning and quits, you know, four or mm -hmm, five. Mm -hmm. Well, that's amazing. And, you know, I'll tell you what, technology has been a, a game changer in that space for sure. And it sounds like you're taking full advantage of that. You know what, George, you're very dynamic. I wish we had more time to talk so I could pick your brain, but uh, we, we've got to wrap up. But I do want to ask you this. Do you consider yourself a big reader? Do you have an, an author or a book you can point to our listeners that has had an impact on you or maybe a podcast if you're not a if you're not a big big reader i actually do a lot of reading i really enjoy it basically i'm pulling out my phone here because i'm a, i'm an audible reader okay and so whenever i'm too lazy to pick up books and so i'm always pulling things out you know i um I kind of read all sorts of things. You, you know, if you haven't read it, and this is an old classic, uh, Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Mm -hmm. yep. It's almost like a, everybody's heard of the book. I don't know how many people have actually read it, <laughs> Yeah. but it is so basic and so valuable because if you can kind of hang on, especially the first three, mm -hmm. you've really, not just in business, but in life, you know, have some, some essentials to really you know, help you out in a lot yeah. of ways. That's a good one. I, and I'm sure it's been mentioned before, probably not in a long, long time, but you're right. I mean, I think it's one that everyone has, has heard and knows is out there, but yeah, if you haven't read it, it'd probably be a good, good idea to pick it up. Now, now this is for the wine lovers in the crowd. Okay. All right. So the judgment of Paris uh, now uh, by George Tabor. And it basically, it's basically the story of how California became what it was. Cause in the seventies, no one knew that they could make wine. that was any good. Right. But it's just fascinating to see how a couple of guys who were just winging it transformed an industry. I mean, it, even from a business entrepreneur standpoint, it's fascinating to see how those guys took wine that they could barely get anybody to appreciate it and made it. I mean, the French are now chasing the Californians. Yeah, they took that wine over there and won the, I guess it was competition or whatever it was back in 1976, I guess, or four or something like 76. that. Yeah, yeah. So put Chateau Montalene on the map for sure. So everybody probably in the wine world has heard about that. Well, so speaking of wine and your enjoyment of that, I, I Carrie put a little bug in my ear earlier that you've actually written a book on wine. So I think that's awesome. So what, what was that and how did that come about? This was before COVID. My daughter and I started a, a wine, we call it community wine tasting online blog called Casual Winers. And uh, so when COVID came up, we stopped having our wine tastings. And I spent like three or four months writing this book, A Casual Winers Guide to Picking Wine You Love Every Time. And it started because we went to Bologna, Italy to visit one of my daughters who was studying out there. And Sophie, who's 15 at the time, and I got a wine bug. We've never really drank that much wine, but we really got it. And what we realized when we came home, it was like, Every bottle of wine we drank in Italy was great, but then finding wine you liked here in the States was so hard. And you, am I spending too much? Am I not spending enough? And so the book is really, I mean, it's written for like just about anybody, mm -hmm. but even someone who's really big into wine, it's like, how do you find what you like and how do you, how do you try other things that are similar to what you like? Because some people just say, I got my go-to wine and then they don't try anything else. But, you know, if you like Sauvignon Blanc, well, why don't you try this Gavier? Why don't you try, you know, these other things and take advantage of what the wine world has to offer? That is amazing. I will be trying to find that. Now, is that something you can get on Amazon? I mean, how do you? Yeah, yeah. If you look up and under my name, uh, George Lazaro Diaz, there aren't too many authors with that name. Okay. Yeah, the Casual Winer's Guide to Picking Wine You Love Every Time. Great. We'll link that in the show notes as well. So thanks. That's I'm excited about that. Appreciate it. All right, we've got to wrap up. So Carrie's coming down to the big engagement party this, this weekend, and I know you guys are going to go out and celebrate. So whenever you're at the karaoke bar or at the bar, the karaoke machine gets fired up. Give me your karaoke go-to song that you'll be singing. Uh, I love you just the way you are. <laughs> I, I score big time with Annie, my wife, with that one. That's excellent. As a matter of fact, I did it one time that our, our church was having one of these informal kind of things, and I sang that, and... I really got scored a lot of points with her. And then they gave me like the top prize. Well, that's great. Carrie, you're going to be in the company of uh, fame down there on the, on the karaoke front. All right. So Carrie, whenever you pull George up to sing the duet with you, whenever you're out celebrating the engagement, what is, what's going to be the duet that you and that you and George sing? You know, I can't think of music off the top of my head. 
Hold on. I'm going to look at my playlist and find something. Here, you're supposed to have this on the on lot. We've talked about this before. My karaoke would be like 80s, but they're not necessarily duets. Journey, Don't Stop Believing, but do two people sing that to each other? Well, I mean, you can. You know. I mean, it doesn't have to be a you know duet thing. You can sing a song with two people. It's a duet. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a two-part thing. Okay. So, Well, then that that's what we're going to go with. You're a 1980s person. I didn't realize that. Wow. You weren't even born then. I mean, we can always find, we can always go with a good old Backstreet Boys. Ooh. Yeah, well, that, there, there you go. So I'm looking forward to the video. Whenever Chris sends me the video of you and, and George up there singing Backstreet Boys, that's going to be great. Well, George, thank you so much. This has been very entertaining. I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. We will link both Celebrate the Relationships campaign and also your website for Larry Jacob Internet Marketing Business in our show notes and enjoy oh, it. My Thanks pleasure. a lot. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes and Spotify. It definitely helps us in the ratings, and it also makes it easier for other folks to find the podcast. And as always, a big thank you to producer and editor, Carrie Wolf. Playing Above the Line is sponsored by Aviso Group. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, you can visit our website at avisogroup.com. That's A-V-I-Z-O group.com. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening.